Okay. Well, we decided uh, during the summer time to um, to go through through some of uh, the parables that Jesus taught to his followers and his uh, disciples. So today we find ourselves. It's kind of called the parable of the city on on a hill, and it's about light and salt, and indeed also about a city on a hill. Um, so Jesus was teaching about that. Now, we've been singing quite a few songs about how great our God is. You know, mountains will bow down for Him. Darkness will tremble at His name. And it is this God, it is this Jesus that we were just worshiping by singing. And now we can worship Him by listening to Him, by hearing Him, because He is the one speaking to us, to you and me, through His Word. It is Him, it is Jesus Himself who is here present through His Holy Spirit wanting to talk to us, wanting to reach our hearts and minds and lives. So hear Him, please hear Him. Now what does He say in Matthew chapter 5 verse 13 to 16? I'll read the passage, you can read it with me on the screen. And then Jesus says there, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill um, cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket like I shown everyone you don't put it under a basket but you put it on a stand and it gives light to all in the house or in the tent in the same way let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father who is in heaven now, these are the verses we're going to think about this morning that Jesus was teaching. This kind of parable, what Jesus is using here, it is part of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' greatest teaching sermon in, kind of recorded in, in the Bible. There were crowds following Jesus because Jesus was preaching and proclaiming the kingdom of God. And people were following him and there were crowds. And at some point... There was a huge crowd following him, and he decided to sit down on a hill. Nowadays, when someone is teaching or preaching, we stand up, right? And that time, and in that culture, the teacher would actually sit down. It's just kind of the other way around. Anyways, Jesus was going up a hill, and he sat down, and he was teaching the crowd. And then he, start, he started first with the B attitudes. And the B attitudes, they talk about who and how you enter God's kingdom. Now, we're going to th think about that another time. Who and how. Now, in this section, in these verses, Jesus is mainly uh, teaching what our purpose and our goal in this life, right now, today, tomorrow, and the day after that, is for us. So what is our purpose now? Now, this is what we're going to look at this, this, this morning. Um, okay. And he uses two symbols for that. Well, the two symbols were kind of obvious, and in a way, three symbols. But the salt and the light, those are the two that pop out. But also, he mentions this city on a hill. But salt and light, we're going to focus on, on, on those two. Salt and light, those are the two symbols that he is using. Now, when we just go, th go through the passage and see if we can digest it, see if we can grasp its, its full meaning, then he starts very simple by teaching and saying, you are the salt of the earth. First, the first bit of verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. Now, we might be sitting here and think, ah, uh, should be supposed to cheer now. <laughs> I'm the soul of the earth. Uh, nowadays, we would think, I'd rather be the diamonds of the earth or the gold or the silver of the earth. 
that will be cool, but salt, I'm the salt of the earth. Okay. Doesn't sound very cool. Or, or, or maybe, is it? Well, we, I suppose we have to go back a little bit in Jesus' time, but because in the time of Jesus, of course, gold and silver was very valuable, but salt was also very valuable in that time. Roman soldiers sometimes even got paid in salt. That's why they have the saying, he's not worth his salt. So salt was very precious and valuable in that time. But Jesus uses that to, to say, okay, you are valuable because it is a valuable kind of mineral. But salt has also a few different purposes, a few different uses. We'll, we'll delve into that also a little bit more. So soldiers, Roman soldiers, sometimes got paid in salt. So it is valuable. So I think one of the points Jesus is making here towards his disciples, towards the crowd, he's saying, you are the salt of the earth. In other words, you could also say, you are valuable. In our time, you are valuable. You are worth something. And maybe you're sitting here, maybe you came this morning not feeling very valuable. Maybe you have feelings of guilt or maybe you have feelings of failing God. In, maybe in your family, in your, uh, maybe in your marriage, maybe in serving God in church or contributing in society, maybe you feel like a loser. And Jesus is here to say, you are the soul of the earth. I can work with you and you are valuable. This is what I'm saying to you. You are. But maybe you're still sitting here thinking, my goodness, I don't have the skills or the gifts. I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not outgoing. I'm not good looking. I'm not. And Jesus says, you are valuable to me. You are valuable. Remember as well, the disciples that Jesus chose, were they the hot shots in the society that day? No, by no means. They were fishermen. They were, I don't know, in the blue collar laborers, just the, the, the hard working laborers that were not in power positions or the rich and the wealthy. No, no, no. Common people, most of the time uneducated, had this weird country accent. No one in the city could kind of understand them. And those were the ones Jesus chose. And he says, I'm going to work with you. I want you to follow me and I'm going to teach you and I'm going to work through you. Because it doesn't depend on you, it, does, it, it, it depends on me. And I want to work through you. I love you. I want to save you first, and I now want to shine through you. You are the salt of the earth. All right. So salt was valuable. But why was salt and is salt valuable? Because... Probably most of you, if not all, we use salt probably daily, right? Now, there are three main uses and purposes of salt, three main ones. Which ones are they? Preservation. Okay, preservative. Okay, number one. What is the other? Cooking for seasoning. Yes, makes things tasty. How do we have another one? Sorry? Defrosting. It's very popular in Holland. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. That, uh, I'll remember that one. I, I did not put that on my list. Even as a Dutch, I can't believe it. Yeah, flavors. Yeah, with cooking. Yeah. Um, it's white. Yeah, it's okay. It's got a very, if you have pure salt, it's nice to look at. Anyway, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for another one. What does salt do? If you, yes, it's a disinfectant. It is, it is a kind of a purifier, an antiseptic. Um, so it can heal infections. I remember once when I was a teenager, we were running around in the, in, in the bush playing, shooting each other. But I, I stepped with my foot in a plank with a nail coming right through. 
well, I had that nail in my foot. So what did I do? I One of the things we did, we had to do a few things, but one of the things I did, we had to purify it. So I had to, my foot in a bucket of water with a lot of salt in it to clean it out. It cleans, it purifies. So th at least three main uses, and there are more uses of salt, but the three main uses is it is a preservative, it is a purifier, and you use it for seasoning. Now, if we just think a little bit about those three, in terms of the gospel being Christians, and that Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. Well, number one, if you, if you think about being a preservative, well, a preservative, if you put it in meat, for example, it's, it preserves, it prevents meat from rotting away. Now, if, if we are the preservative of this world, then we as Christians have a very important function in our society. Because if we look around in our society, without any Christian morals, without any Christian standards, this world, I think it would go down the spiral a lot faster. I believe that God is using his people all around the world to preserve this world from totally going into utter chaos. And it is already chaotic. But imagine, and the Bible talks about it when it comes to the future. Imagine if all Christians would be taken out, what would happen then? Hmm. I don't think it will get better. We have a, a function to show, to, to kind of season this world with forgiveness, with looking out for one another by showing how relationships and family should work. And yes, we are broken as well. And then if we're broken and if we face challenges or if things go wrong, then we can show in a Christian way how we go about that in a different way than our non-believing friends and colleagues. How do we value life, character, morals? Do we honor God with it? Are we seasoning this world with that kind of salt? Now, the second one is sold as a purifier, as a cleaner, as healing. So salt water can heal wounds. If you go swim in the ocean, it will kind of, because this, the water is salt, it is kind of good for little wounds to be in salty water. But if you have really salty water, and if you do have an infection or a wound, it, can, it, it does have a bit of a sting to it, right? A, a bit of a bite. You feel it, but it's good that you feel it. It means it's cleaning, but, but it is, it does have a pinch and a bite and it is confronting, but, but, but that is also one of our tasks as Christians. Are we daring? Do we have the courage to be also this purifying salt to, in a loving way, maybe confront or reflect to people around us, hey, ah, I think this is a wound and it needs to be cleaned and healed. Do we, do we dare to be this kind of soul that has a pinch and a bite to it? Do we dare sometimes to risk the confrontation? And yes, it can have two results. Some people will will run away kicking and screaming and maybe yelling at you. And other people might receive it and say afterwards, thank you. I needed that truth. I needed to hear that because it actually helped me. Yes, it hurt for a bit. But oh boy, are we preaching Jesus as the way? Are we preaching and sharing Jesus as the only God? Do we refer to the Bible as our standard and as the truth and trustworthy and faultless? Or, or are we sugarcoating the gospel, our Christian life? Jesus called us to be kind of purifying salt, not to sugarcoat it. Sugarcoating it might be very yummy, but that's not the truth, and it is not healing, and it is not purifying. Well, and then I think the way we like our salt the best as seasoning. 
to make things tasty. If you watch different cooking shows, you will probably hear it over and over and over again. Season your food. Where is the seasoning? And then it is often salt and pepper, to be fair, but at least salt is always in there, right? If the salt is missing, it is bland, it is tasteless, and salt can amplify, can, can get the taste and the richness out of food. It can bring it to the surface so you can enjoy it even more. If you have a nicely baked or poached or scrambled egg and you have some salt on it and it is just right and you eat it, what do you say? Mmm, oh, that was a great piece of salt. Oh, my goodness. No, you say, wow, that was a good egg. But the salt had a big deal in it, had made a big difference in it. Now, salt, when it comes to seasoning, and in, in a way, in, in any uh, way, there was a preacher called Tasker, and he said it in this way about salt. Salt is the most obvious of, sorry, the most obvious general characteristic of salt is its essential difference from the medium in which it is placed. Salt is different. That is the kind of the characteristic of salt. Whatever you put it, whatever you do with it, the distinctive is, is that it is radically different. It is different because it is healing. It is different because it is seasoning. And it is different because it is preserving, but it is different. Now, the big question then will be for us, for you and me, are we salty? Are we giving our surroundings at work, at the sports club, at our neighbors, at our friends, at, at our family, in our, are we giving our surrounding, surroundings a taste of Jesus? Are we kind of tasty, salty? Are we sprinkling salt in the way we go about things? And it can be in our deeds, it can be in our attitude, it can be in our actions, but are we different? Are we, are you the one? that says to the colleague whose relationship just ended, hey, let's grab a beer, just to talk and listen. Are you the one, as the Christian, that cleans up the mess of your colleague without taking credits for it? Because that would be different. Are we the one walking away from gossip and say, no, I forgive. If need be, I'll confront, and I'll have the purif purifying taste as well. But, but whatever the reaction will be, I will deal with it, and I, and I will take it in a Christian manner. Are we different? Well, because... The parables are very nice to read through, right? And lots of them are stories, and it is we kind of get drawn in. But when we read further as well, you know, we started, you are the soul of the earth, very valuable, with a great purpose. But Jesus also says, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. What did Jesus mean with this? If, if salt loses its kind of purity, then it loses its taste. This is the word that, that Jesus uses here in the, kind of in the Greek. It is tasteless. Um, the Greek word is moreno, to become foolish. But tasteless, without taste. So it is mixed with all other stuff, and it is you can't really use it as salt anymore i think it would be comparable with becoming kind of nominal christians what i mean with that is you call yourself a christian but you're no different than your surroundings or the world so there's no difference between the christian and the non-christian 
That is a nominal Christian. We should be different. Now, what does Jesus mean with, okay, it, it, it can't be used except to be thrown out and trampled on this people's feet. What does Jesus mean with that? Well, in that time, if salt was mixed and was not being able to be used for salt anymore, what did they do with it? They used it to make roads with it. So they throw it on the road to make the roads kind of hard and uh, easy to travel on. But it also meant that you'll, you know, if, if, if you're kind of the salt, you'll be trampled upon <laughs> all day long. That is what it's being used for, but it loses its purpose completely from Jesus' intention. Now, let me be clear on this one as well. Can someone, can any of you, if you're a child of God, if you are saved and forgiven by God, can any of you lose your salvation? I believe if you are truly saved, if you are truly born again, you can never, never lose your salvation. If you are a child of God, you can never, ever lose your salvation. Let me be totally clear on that. But I do believe that Jesus is teaching you, you can lose your purpose in this life. You can lose your tastiness in this life. And you will be saved. In 1 Corinthians 3, you see that, okay, you will be saved as through fire, but you will be saved, but your purpose has lacked. Now, I think we all enjoy pure salt the best. Now, let's, let's try to be as pure salt as we can be. Effective, to be used, to be fruitful. But also to be loving and kind and bearing towards one another because we need bearing with. Because we might look at someone else and say, oh my goodness, really? And that same person might look at you and think, really? <laughs> we all have things to work on. We are all not like Jesus yet. So we are all a work in progress. But let's help each other out. Let's support each other in the process. Now, the second symbol, because this is Saul, the second symbol that Jesus mentions is, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. So, as Christians, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. And the purpose of this light is that the world sees it shining. So, we are meant to shine the light of Jesus, of God. We are meant to kind of radiate that and people to be able to see it because a city on a hill cannot be hidden. We should not be hidden. And, and what this kind of means is that your and my faith, our faith, as we are sitting here together, it is not a private matter. It is not something you do only in private. Yes, you also do it in private, of course. But it is definitely also something to be done publicly so that everyone can see its shine. But we like it more privately because we get less resistance. We get less people looking. We get less people watching and criticizing and, and doing or saying. All. But we are meant to shine. We are the light of the world. And it is not a private matter. It is a public matter. I, years ago, I heard this example. We as Christians... We are not the spiritual Christian CIA. No. We are not the Christian secret agents. No, we are public. And sometimes that comes with a great cost. As elsewhere in the world, they pay it sometimes with their lives, but they do it publicly. And the more they suffer publicly, the more people come to faith, the more people getting saved. This is how it works. So, let our lights shine. Another question is, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. But is it us ourselves shining? Is it my light that I can shine? I, 
I think one of the great examples I found is that it's not my light. I'm, I'm reflecting someone else's light. I'm reflecting the light of God, who is light. A question, we look at night when the clouds are gone, we look at the moon, right? Now, the moon shines, right? Who, who knows where that light comes from? Is, is it the moon that shines this light? Or does it come from somewhere else? Who knows? It's actually the light from the sun. And the moon is only reflecting the light of the sun. So we see the moon and we say, the moon is shining. No, the moon is reflecting the light of the sun. And I find that such a great example. We, we are allowed to be kind of like the moon, reflecting the light of God who shines upon us, is merciful to us, works in us, and we are reflecting and able to shine that into the world. So, um, okay, now we have a last verse, verse 16. And Jesus says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Okay, so here we got the good works thing. Jesus says, okay, you know, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So the purpose is that people give glory to God. Now, the good works bit, that needs a little bit of explanation. Because good works, when we read through, through the Bible, good works kind of, in a way, glorifying God in our lives by helping other people out, forgiving, loving, bearing with one another, being generous, uh, praising God, uh, reading His His Word, all part of good works. But those good works are a fruit of our salvation, are a fruit of the fact that we are a child of God, that, like Leon said earlier, if we realize how merciful this holy God is towards me, it affects me, it changes my life, and I start doing things differently, and those things differently are good works, but they are not good works that cause my salvation, that I'm, I'm, that I'm going to God, God, look at me, look at me, I'm doing all good things, now, now you have to accept me, no, 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 God has accepted me. My goodness, this changes me from the inside. It changes my perspective, my lookout. It changes where my energy and focus and money and resources all go towards. And they are a result of the love that God has given to me already. And that is reflecting again. That is letting my, or really God's light shine through my life. And the Bible is also very clear that we can have good works, that people may see those good works and give glory to our Father who is in heaven. But the Bible is also very clear that we have to explain the gospel. We have to articulate the gospel with words. Otherwise, people will think, oh, you're a very good atheist. Well, I'm not an atheist. I, I do good works because someone has done good work for me on the cross, dying for me, saving me, serving me. That's why I Forgive, serve, and do good works. Now, the end question of this parable, which is so familiar, which is so kind of general knowledge among Christians. The big question is, are we, as IBC, salty and shining? Maybe... This coming season, we can turn it up a notch. Maybe we got it on a dimmer. Let's, let's get the volume buttons up and shine brighter and more. Let me pray, and then we continue singing worship songs. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your goodness. We do thank you for your forgiveness. 
which we so desperately need because you are holy and almighty and righteous. Yet you are also so loving that you sacrificed your son for us. And Father, we thank you for the teachings that we may read from your word. And that you are calling us the light and the salt of the earth. Father, I pray and ask you that you will work in our hearts, in our lives, that our saltiness and our shining may become stronger and brighter. Father, forgive us where it is needed and work in and through us to glorify yourself. Father, we ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.